unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Give your neighbor a high five one more time. And tell him, tell him I, I love you with the love of the Lord. How have you been? <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> Some of you, your high fives are. I saw somebody just. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a pleasure having you, every one of you. Praise God. We thank God for the men and women of God in the building. Pastor Modesta, Pastor Sam, the IKs. Pastor Shama is here. We were, we were. We were at the New Life Church, his ministry in Mokono. They have a wonderful, wonderful vision in Mokono. Praise God. Musumba Sekaran is in the house. <laughs> Pastor Zach Mutiaba, Apostle Emma Maweje, Mrs. Benita Maweje is in the house. Mrs. Lucinda is in the house. Those are my mothers. Hallelujah. The Omas. <laughs> Pastor Ram, the Bukenyas, Mama Lois, Pastor Mwide, Stephen, the Apostle Solomon, many wonderful men of God, Pastor Iga, Pastor Chibirige, Murisa. I see many people. Some have been lost on my face, but I've seen them today. We bless the Lord. Hallelujah. And there are other men and women of God also who are in hiding. Yeah, they are waving. You see, I love your faith. <laughs> I love your faith. I love your faith. Praise God. Um, where are the Mr. and Mrs. Aaron? Tumukunde. Are they here? The Tumukundes. Are they here? Mr. and Mrs. Aaron Tumukunde. They have a baby. They here? Put up your hands if you're here. I don't want to be me. Come with a baby. They have a baby to dedicate today. So I thought we'd begin with that. What do you think? Stay standing. Even you don't stand on your children. You might tell me, but I finished. You never know. <laughs> Come on with a baby. I don't want to carry somebody and then you know these days I'm so anointed a kid can get slain what's the name of the kid Emerald lovely Ariel at Zimukunde <laughs> Woo! I remember her isn't God good praise the Lord Jesus Christ we take it a point to pray for these children. Hallelujah. And usually, we ask you before we pray for them, do you as the parents pledge before God to raise up this child in the way that she should go? Yes, you do. That's important. Stretch forth your hands and pray for them. Speak in tongues. 
Father, we thank you for Emerald. We thank you for this child. This child indeed is for signs and wonders. This child is potent. We thank you for what this child is going to be. That this child shall be for signs and wonders. This child shall go ahead of us in the name of Jesus. They will do things earlier and quicker than we did in the name of Jesus Christ. They will run and not grow weary. These ones shall be strengthened by you. They will stand before you. They will walk before you. They will serve before you. And they will leave this world before you. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray and believe. Amen. Another one came in the middle. What's the name? Martha. Matthias Lubega. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Praise God. You may go and sit. We've prayed for him too. Matthias Lubega. It had to be. I was wondering why. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, I also want to pray for the offering right away. It says that when I start, we don't get interrupted, okay? Tell you about we give us here. And we give B. Tell your neighbor, God is not a dustbin. Don't dump loose change. Give. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the offering that people are going to take. Multiply each one. Their fruit of righteousness. And everything that pertains to their lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Tell your neighbor, at the anniversary, you must preach. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because we figure this way. If you do a small multiplication and do 3,500 people, right? Roughly. That is the least it can be. Times 14 people. That means that's 49,000 going times 2. 49,000 coming back. That means we have an opportunity to reach 100,000 people by the gospel. You have a benefit. You understand what I'm saying? You know why I'm saying that? Please take it with uttermost reverence toward God. We need to preach to 100,000 people. In every tree. Hallelujah. Some of you, I know your office people. That's why we are sending 2 2. If you're not comfortable preaching, open a conversation. You're the one who has paid. Speak a mystery in the taxi. At the end of the route, you ask, and by the way, as we are sharing, if there's anybody who feels convicted, just raise your hands. We'll lead you through a confession prayer. Who knows how many are going to come to Christ that day? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Saf also has a baby and his wife. What's the name of the kid? Shama Prince. You see, only pastors today. Hallelujah. We're not dedicating anything less than that. Stretch your hands towards Shama Prince. Father, we thank you for Shama Prince. We thank you for this child. We thank you for the gift that they are to this world and the worlds to come. We thank you because they are represented in the other realm. We thank you because they are a symbol of strength, a symbol of joy, happiness, restoration, and life to their family. This child, Lord, will you keep? Many days shall you teach, and his peace shall be many. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. We are excited about the anniversary. Tell your family members to book those debts. If somebody is planning to die, tell them to wait a bit. They can die after, but, but not, not, not in the anniversary. You understand? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Are you hungry for God? Can you lay down every crown and just worship Jesus? Lay down the crown of being a president of your company, lay down the crown of being the branch manager of your branch, lay down the crown of being the wonderful HR, lay down that crown of being the most successful businesswoman in Kampala, 
just raise your hands to God and just worship Him for who He is. Host Allah Baba. Every crown I ever won, I laid down. Every praise I ever heard, I give it all to you. There is nothing in this world that can compare. Yeah. Okay. 
手过来领。First time I'm going to share this. I want to tell you what this song means to me. When I was about 19, 20, I was on a prayer mountain in Ankara in Mokono. I was in university. And a certain man of God called me to go and lead worship at the mountain because he was preaching. And I remember. That was the song that came to my heart. And I started singing it. I started singing it. By the time I was done with that song, my spirit was lifted and I left my body literally. For two hours, I was not on earth. For two hours. Two. By the time I came back in my body, it was dark. The presence of God is not an imaginary place. It's, it's a place. It's a place. The presence of God is a place. You know, sometimes we sing and stay present on us. God has not called us to be present on us. He says for to be absent from the body is to be present with him. Somebody talk to God and tell him I need you now. I'll sing your praises forever. Deeper in love with you. Here in your courts where I flow to your throne. I found where I belong. Tell him, Lord, I'll sing your praises. Tell him, Lord, I'll sing 
mighty hand have a praise. Your sins are washed all the way. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. All your sins are washed all the way. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God holds no record. He holds no record. He holds no record. No record. No record. Somebody thank God for forgiving us. Just thank Him. Thank Him. There is no power as strong as love. Hallelujah. It's not there. Our God is a forgiving God. Can you believe everyone here is forgiven? Everyone here is forgiven. Regardless of what you did, God has forgiven you. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful experience to know that we are forgiven. I'm prompted to see the certain song. It says, All as indeed my Savior bleeds and in my soul down would he do that sacred heart for see the sun as I at the cross at the cross there so and the
praise God. I'm too happy. Now, do you see your reason of being happy? God doesn't have a record. He doesn't have a record. It's God. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Say amen. I'm told we have wonderful visitors uh, from Doha, Qatar, right? Ranjit and Philip. Ranjit, Philip, and Anja. Is it Anja? You're welcome. How is Doha? It's hot. <laughs> You're welcome. There's a pastor there. My God. Can you come and say hello? Come. He's the first pastor I've met from Doha. Come, come. Say hello to these people. Hello. Amen. I'm so glad to be here with my wife, Anju, and with my co-brother, Otim, and Rinju. It's such a joy to be in God's house. Amen. We, we don't have stadiums like this in Doha, but we're praying one day that we'll worship in a stadium like this in the Middle East. It's such a joy to be with you and worship Jesus, our King. New Life Fellowship. New Life Fellowship. New Life Fellowship. It's a pleasure meeting you. Hallelujah. Doha. Has anybody been to Doha? Put up your hands if you have been to Doha. Not by faith. Come on. I know you guys. I'm talking of physically. In the flesh. In the flesh. The climate in Doha is too, too, too fragile for the church. I bet you the freedom he's feeling now is different from the way he feels back home. Doha is so... It's a Muslim place. We pray for you. We pray for you. That your eyes will see these things. With God all things are possible. Tell your neighbor, with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. I had promised to preach something for some time and I felt the release to share it. Hallelujah. I've been mentioning it a bit in bits uh, regarding the, the a few sermons have been chipping it in and out. Eh? But today the Lord insisted and said finish this issue. Hallelujah. Praise God. Matthew 19, 12. If you're there, say amen. You see that I've mentioned that scripture before, but I've not given it time to explain it. And today the Lord told me, do it. Let's read. One, two, three, let's go. For there are some eunuchs, uh uh-huh, which were born so from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him what? Receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us that if a man requires a mastery of things, that man must be tempered in all things. I usually use such statements because you must understand that ministry is not by chance. You understand? Christians don't have chances. They have graces. You understand? Ministers don't have what? Chances. They have what? Graces. And the grace on a man or woman's life can multiply. You understand what I'm saying? The grace on a man's life can multiply. That is why the Bible says grow in grace. It's possible to grow in grace. You understand? And in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus the Savior. To him be glory both now and forever. That was Peter. It's possible for the grace of God upon your life to increase. Some of you think that where you are is where you're going to be all your life. It is because you've been taught the wrong way and the wrong things about Christ. 
The essence of the glory of God is as we behold in the mirror the glory of God, he says we are changed from, from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, the moment you behold, you are changed. It's possible for you to be better in grace tomorrow morning than you were today. And it's possible for you to stay on the same level in many aspects of your life. The grace of God can be increased on a man. Don't doubt it. Some of you, the day you started working is not the same pay you have now. There was a grace that increased upon your life. Some of you, a few years ago, you were not married. Now you're married. There's a grace increased upon your life. Some of you did not have children. Now you have children. There's a grace that has increased upon your life. Some of you got newer opportunities. Some of you were promoted in ministry. Some of you saw God deeper. In other words, the grace of God can increase on your life any day. Are we together? Any day. Don't think that where you are is a limitation or that where you are is the definite story of the will of God concerning your life. Of course, many people read, let thine will be done on earth as is in heaven. But if you read that scripture very well, you realize it says, let thine will be done on earth, comma, as is in heaven. In other words, let the experience of heaven come on us. It's that simple. Many people set up a status quo and then they think. In fact, the word status quo is the mess that we're in, right? It's mediocrity. It's the mess. It's, it's, status quo is a mess because you, you are like everyone. Hallelujah. And God has called us to be distinct. When the Bible says you shall be the head and not the tail... God can provide for a million heads. And he can multiply tails too. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Status quo is the word that means the mess that we're in. That's it's a mess. God has not called you to be like the people of the world. That is why he tells us don't be unequally yoked. You're already unequal before you yoke. You're unequal. Go there and look at you with an unbeliever and think that you're equal. No, you're not equal. Are we together? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So if he says you shall be the heads and not the tail, even if we were 50 billion Christians, oh well, we are 7 billion on the face of the earth, but if the earth had grown to 50 billion Christians, he would still provide the numbers enough for us to be heads over. I don't know that you understand what I'm saying. That is why you say, with God, all things are possible. The Bible says that the foundations of the world are out of course. Because they understand not. Neither they know. That's the challenge of the Christian faith. He says, they know not, they not, not, neither do they understand. They walk in darkness and all the foundations of the world are out of course. The world is out of course because there's a knowledge the child of God does not have and an understanding. So the more we give knowledge and understanding, the more we put the world on course. In other words, it's our responsibility to put the world on course. The Bible says it's not unto the angels that he gave the worlds to come, but unto you and I. In other words, the future belongs to you and I. It's my responsibility to put it on course. And he says in that day, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times, and it shall be the strength of your salvation. You will be strong because you know. You'll be strong because you understand. I know that we're living in an environment where Christians love short fixes. I'm sick. Pray for me. You cast out. I need a prophetic word. What is the Lord saying? And then the Lord says, you understand? And, and it's always in and out. It's just a spiral. But it goes downward because it doesn't seek to know God. It seeks to know what he's saying about his situation or her situation and circumstance. It seeks to, for God to intervene on their personal need. But at the end of the day, sometimes we become selfish. We become selfish because it's always about us. And it's always about us and it's always about us. It's always about us. That is why many Christians err in the things of the gospel. Because they don't take the gospel as priority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So when he says in the last days wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of the time. It means we're moving in a time where you must be wise by God. We're living in a time where you must know God yourself, personally, through his word. 
And as long as insight is given to you by his truth, your life changes. Every other day, as the word of God comes to your spirit, your life changes. Your life changes. Your life changes. Some of you do not know what it is to have the truth in our nation. Because you don't know where you come from. There's a gentleman called George Pilkington. He came in about 1893 in Buganda. And he found a church there. But he got so frustrated and separated himself on an island for days. Because he reached the church and discovered that what they defined as God and Christ was different from what he read. Brethren, it's very possible, very, very possible to think you know and yet you do not know. He did not look at them and judge them and point fingers on them, no. Also to correct them. He went in an island to pray on Sese Island to seek God to ask what is wrong with the church in Uganda. That brain is behind the translation of the Bible in Uganda, George Pilkington. He had spiritual experiences. By the time he came back, he started to pray for the revival of our land. And about 1926, 27, we see the coming in of the Edward George Church and Decima, his wife. We see the coming in of Lawrence Baham. And then God starts to raise guys. Then he raises the Chigozis, bless you. He raises the Shalitas, Kosia. He raises the Yosia Chinookas. He raises the Sibambis. When Joe goes to Mango. And one account is given. There was a certain lady. She was called Mabel Enso. She was a nurse. She was an Irish nurse in Namirembe. And this woman started a fellowship. And the reason why she started a fellowship was she wanted people to have an experience of truth. Because the church then had a different understanding of grace and truth. You understand? The church can marry other things and get a spouse to many things. But even if it belongs to Christ, it's still a spouse to others. I'm talking to eunuchs now. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, when you read the scriptures, you realize that the men of old, men which were called eunuchs, were men which were castrated, simplest language, mutilated. Their parts were mutilated. And they were not supposed to marry or espouse to another. And their primary ministry was to serve the king. Are we together? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's when Joe Church comes and preaches the message of Christ and the victorious church and the infill of the Holy Ghost. And that's when he meets in Sibambi. They start believing God for the move of our nation. Indeed, the power of God was great during that day. It was great during that day. In the 1940s, I read of a certain convention where men were convicted of sin and they came to repentance. When the man of God in Sibambi shouted, TV, TV, no. sin is very bad, exceedingly bad. And salvation came to the church. And God started to raise the church. But the church needed ex- an experience of teaching. Because it's one thing to win men over, but it's another when men are not taught. Are we together? And when that generation started to go by as the church was settling now to teach men which had been converted, there was a need that men understood the word. And that is why some of you have had experiences of the people they call them azukufu, the awakened ones. They didn't believe in, back in those days, they didn't believe in cleaning houses. They didn't believe in washing clothes. They saw that doing your hair was sin. And they had their rights. And I read an article of the one man, Sivambi, explaining where the problem was. And they had a movement too. There was an Oxford group that came too. So there were many things that transpired in our land. By the time the church is waking up to the truth and the word, then another gentleman called Obiri Eboa comes. Some of you have heard of him. And there's a story there too. But there was no teaching in our land. Now, God has started to bring the word. I mean... To our land. You understand what I'm saying? And this is not only with I. It's many other men and women of God. He's opening our spirits to now say, yes, the move was wonderful. And we celebrate those men which brought the move of the Holy Spirit to our land. But now we need to reconcile the word and the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? 
Because today, some ministries are very legal. Some of them don't understand the difference between grace and law. <laughs> I don't know any extreme grace ministry, but they say they exist. <laughs> Hallelujah. Although I have always contended with my fellow friends that the more extreme grace is, the more sin goes. I mean, that's what the Bible says. The more... <laughs> the more the sin came and the more the grace abounded. So the extremity of grace, I believe, brings salvation. But I believe that some with their own understanding of English language have the extremity. But all things are pure to them which are pure. And to the defiled and unbelieving, the Bible says nothing is what? It's pure. So, we are in a very sensitive place where God wants to reconcile the spirit with the word. He wants a prophet who is deep. He wants a healing evangelist who is deep. He wants an, a, a teacher who is deep. He wants a pastor who is deep. He wants an usher who understands the mystery of godliness. Hallelujah. And that we begin to do by teaching and the things that he's revealing to us every other day. Each one of us. Some of you are not on this pulpit, but believe you me, God is speaking louder than he has ever spoken before in this land. Hallelujah. And I believe that we have a mandate that goes across the borders of this nation. You need to understand that our nation is in the center of everything. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So, the appreciation of this is that when the, the foundations of the, our world are out of course, what God needs between you and I is simple. Knowledge and what? Understanding. The moment knowledge and understanding comes, we'll put the world back to order. But knowledge is more than just knowledge. Knowledge is more than just knowledge. Knowledge has degrees, if I may say. Not everything you read in the scriptures is straightforward. The Bible says in the scriptures, for us that God would preach his gospel to the Gentiles, he went... He would, he would redeem or reveal or save the Gentiles through faith. The Bible says he went and preached this gospel to Abraham, saying, in these shall all nations be blessed. It was a simple statement. That was a truth. And that's a level of knowledge to know that in these shall all nations be blessed. That was a knowledge. But God spoke to Abraham these statements referring to the gospel. Referring to the gospel. There was no way nations would be blessed if the gospel was wrong. The total sum of why you see the church struggling is knowledge. Let me tell you. It doesn't matter how much a man appears to know. And how much a man says to know. If what that man teaches cannot relate with his experiences, that man does not know. He does not know. He's just a vessel. He has a vessel. He has not possessed. You understand? He has not possessed it. When he possesses his vessel, your knowledge starts to equal to your experiences. And that is why there are men who don't speak much, but when I see how they do it, I get to think they know. I just get to think they know. I just get to think that they know. Hallelujah. Why? Because truth manifests God. That's what Titus says. A truth that tenders to godliness. That's why I put a light in my head every day and say, God, deal with this guy because I don't want to just deal with me. Me. This is mine. You also have your part with God. Me, I have my part with God. And I have to be honest with him and tell him, Lord, in this area, I need to carry the experience of what I'm teaching. Because that's the only way it will produce fruit and multiply grace in the ears of my hearers. That's why Paul says, I would rather not speak, save of the things that Christ has wrought by me to do what? To make the Gentiles both obedient by word and deed. When you experience what you know, the grace of God will multiply upon your life in the lives of other people. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. A man can get healed of an incurable disease and give a testimony and nobody gets healed. And another can get healed of the same disease 
and just shares his testimony. And then multitudes are healed. Why? Because one of them carries the experience of the testimony. The other carries the form. Are we together? So when the Bible says that if a man requires a mastery of things, if you want to be a master at something, you just don't want to be an average preacher. You just don't want to be an average worshiper. You just don't want to be an average businesswoman. You just want to be an average accountant. You don't want to be an average banker. You just don't want to be an average mother. You don't want to be an average father. You just don't want to be an average child. You just don't want to be an average engineer. You just don't want to be an average contractor. You just don't want to be an average individual. When he says if you want a mastery, of things you must be temperate in all things you must understand how these things come you must know the life that brings these things you must know that master is not by chance and let me tell you if a man gets up there by chance he needs the grace to understand how to be sustained still the principles if he doesn't get them he will come down you come down it's only a matter of time why because those patterns are grace. They are graces. They are graces. They are graces. Let me tell you something. Do you know you can do one thing and affect the rest of your ten years on earth? Do you know that? Do you know, let me say it the other way, that you can do one thing, and it affects many people who are not in it. Do you understand what I'm saying? One time I was sharing with an individual, and I told him, for example, I was sharing with a friend here, and I told him, see, all of us have blood, right? Human blood. And as you continue to know God, you realize that your blood changes, right? But you see, you remember when Cain killed Abel, for example? You remember when Cain killed Abel? The Bible tells us that the blood of his brother cried out from the ground. Speaking what? Vengeance. Are you hearing me? This was a man's blood crying out from the ground. And the Bible says in the New Testament dispensation that that blood up to today still speaketh. There are many people who have been killed, but their blood doesn't speak. But the blood of Abel speaks up to this day. It speaks. Praise the Lord. He says, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaks. He still speaks. There's something about him that still speaks. You understand what I'm saying? It's like... One time I gave an example and I said, there was a boy, was it Tunisia? The guy who burnt himself? Yeah. Huh? Tunisia. Egypt to Tunisia. That young man woke up in the morning in the market and got tired. And he set himself ablaze. And you can do it and not change a government. And they get, they write a report and they say, mentally unstable. And your family buries you. But there is blood you can't kill. Or there is blood that just can't die. Some men live by the masses of other men. This nation can be stable and one person dies. And the whole nation goes on fire. And there is a situation where millions can die. And nothing changes in a nation. Nothing. He say, ah, the Holocaust. It took millions of men, yes. But Hitler stayed. Do you understand? But then one guy sets himself on fire. And the whole nation runs mad. Remember Lamech? He says, I shall avenge his life 70 times. If anybody touched Lamech, 70 times he would avenge his life. He didn't say it for every man with Lamech. But there was something on that man that was different. Are we together? There's something different about you. Because the blood that flows in your veins is the very blood which is of Christ. For we are members, the Bible says, of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You cannot die no more. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. There's something about you. There's something inside you that can cause a nation to change. There's something inside you that can cause that continent to shake. There's something inside your spirit. I cannot convince you. I can only ask you humbly, believe it. Just believe it. Just believe it. Just believe it. There are people in this world, if they die, the church would be in trouble. There are people in this world, if they die, the church would be revealed, redeemed. <laughs> the church would be what? Redeemed. The Bible says, I gave up nations. Egypt and Seba for you. He gets to a point and says, ah, ah, I can lose those millions for this fellow. You must know what's inside you. You must know what's inside you. He gave out Ethiopia and Seba. He just gave it and said, no, let it go. Why? For you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So you must take this life of salvation more serious than you think. Now, back to the story. Because we all are supposed to subject ourselves to mastery, we don't, we cannot be normal. We cannot be normal. We have to be distinct. We must understand that there are things that make distinction. Hallelujah. There are things in this world that draw distinction on every one of us. You might be normal now, but something can happen today. And God places something upon your life. And your life changes for good. For good. And I mean for good. And I mean for good. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, let me show you something about the making of ministers. He went to the eunuchs and he said, look. When we look at this kind of experience, you're dealing with men which were denied to be espoused or to marry. And so they are castrated. This is old wisdom. I mean, even in Buganda here, we used to have them. What do they used to call them? Abalawi, right? They used to castrate them, mutilate them. These were the closest men to the king. They used to go in the queen's room and late. Why? Because <laughs> the mystery was, you don't worry about that guy watching over the queen. And they don't know that the scripture says we cannot do anything against the truth, but for the truth. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. I'm talking of the spiritual eunuch. You can never do anything. You see, when I tell people that a man of God can't do anything against God, you must understand, he can't. He can't. He can't. He can't. Unless you don't know what it means to be a man of God. He can't. Do anything. He can do something against himself. But he can't do something against God. Because they are, you see. Anyway, you'll understand later as I'm sharing. So, the reason why the castle is that they will not think and indulge in any other duties except the simplest mind. Every morning to please the king. Hallelujah. To serve the masters. As is physically there is also such experiences as spiritually there are people in this world in fact if you read the word therefore eunuchs the word called saris meaning officials of the state you understand put it in a kingdom perspective they are officials in a state they are not just laymen no they are not just laymen they have civil they, they are they, they have they are above men in the kingdom. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. They are officials. They hold certain offices in the state. Certain responsibilities that strengthen the running of that particular state. Now, put it in a kingdom perspective. There are men who God uses to run certain things in the world. Hallelujah. That is why the Bible says that he giveth the kingdom to whosoever he chooses. To whosoever he chooses. God can choose. He says, this is a matter. Yeah. 
He says, this is the matter by the decree and of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rulers in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest men. God can choose to give you leadership in the kingdom. Are you hearing me? And those are places in the spirit. And I can tell you, they're deeper than just what we call the fivefold ministry. They're deeper than the fivefold ministry. They are pastors, but they are pastors who are above certain pastors. They are teachers, but they are teachers who are above certain teachers. They are evangelists, but they are evangelists who are above certain evangelists. All of them are, but there are some which are above. And some people say, ah, no, it's, 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 it's the race which God has set before every man. No, 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 no. That's what you think. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. We've all been given the measure. The measure of faith. And if we all have the measure of faith, it means we can all believe for bigger things. Because faith is not limited. It's not limited. Faith is not limited. You cannot give me a scripture like whatsoever you ask. And then you say, but, but when you say whatsoever... This, this is how far you can go. No, that's not God. That's Pharaoh. He says, go worship, but do not go far. The life of Christianity is supposed to be a limitless source. Not a limited source. It is supposed to be a limitless source. He says, and thou shalt meditate on these words day after night. They shall not depart from thy mouth. That thou shalt make your way prosperous and have good success. You make your way. If you want a million people, you make your way. It's up to you, but you have to make it. At least carry the satisfaction that this is what I wanted. He came to give us our heart's desires. Hallelujah. And that is why many people are not suffering from demon spirits. Many people are frustrated because potential is frustrated. When you're walking the face of this earth, and every day there is another thing inside you telling you, I am more than I'm seeing. There's something inside me. I feel it's more than what is happening in my life. That's called frustrated potential. When a person is in that position, God literally is pushing them to the edge to tell them, I'm not comfortable with where you are. The children of Israel had stayed in Edom for so long. He had, in the land of Edomites for so long. He had to come to them on the Mount of Seir and say, for you have been on this mountain for so long. Move. Move. For 38 years. Move. If God had not come in to push them, they were going to stay there for another couple of years. God knows how long. You understand? But it's a very good place when a man feels uncomfortable of where they are. Because that's the beginning of God taking you to where you're supposed to be. Somebody say amen. And that is why my pain and tears go out to a man who does not know where he's coming from, where he is, nor where he's going. There are believers in this world who simply have no conviction about the future, except watermelons and bread and meat and the cucumber they were eating in Israel, in Egypt. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people like that. They're in salvation, but they don't even know what they want. They don't even know what they want. If you ask him, why are you saved? What do you see? They don't have an answer. They go back to their small shop, that little retail shop, and say, this is my shop. If God can only increase it, I'm okay. What about the world? What about the multitudes of people that must come to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? What about the affections that have to be melted before his presence? To see not only the salvation, but the healing of multitudes. Because he came to heal. He came to deliver. He came to save. And he can only do that through us. He can only do that through us. And you find a Christian living their life every day and they do nothing in the kingdom. Except the parasite. They just live up to God. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Okay, thank you very much. Now, let me see what else I want. Uh, I want, I want, okay, thank you, Lord. I want. And then we sit in fellowships and, and cell meetings and we start testifying. Last week I asked for this and God gave it to me. And then we cry, hey, praise God. Last week I asked for this and then God prayed for me. I said, oh, praise God. There's a couple that brought their boy this week. I think it's about eight, nine, Moses, right? Little boy like this. 
It was his birthday, so they thought that he should come and cut cake with me, and then we sing happy birthday. And then the boy had written 14 questions. The boy was about eight. 14 questions. And then he told his mother, I want to talk to Apostle Grace. How old is Moses? Seven. Yeah, you were there, Peter, because I showed you the questions. This boy came in my office and insisted to see me. And it was too late, but I said, uh, let the little children come. So... Yeah, I'm good like that. So, I, I, bring, I bring the guy in the office. And then the first question. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? How do I hear the voice of God? How do I use the gifts of the Spirit? How do I know it's God walking through me? I first thought out that I said, God. I've been counseling men beginning of the year. Nobody has come with a spiritual question. They come in my office. You see, my wife, then we pray. That one comes about me and say, you know, my, my car, then we pray. That one goes. Then another one comes now. My job, then that one goes. And there's a seven-year-old asking me, how to hear the voice of the Spirit. Fourteen questions. I gave them to Peter. Peter put his hands on the head and said, My God, what was I doing at this age? <laughs> he grew up from the village, so I know he didn't see Ben Ten or Superman or Batman or He-Man. Those were my days. For him, I think he was riding bicycles and fighting girls on the... I don't know. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. But I was humbled that somebody in this world was seven years old and they were feeling like so. They were feeling like so. And there's somebody who has been in the gospel for many years and they don't have the mind to serve God. They don't have the mind to serve God. Every time they come in the presence of God, they come for need. I need, 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 I need God. I need. I need. I need this. I need this. I need this. Not you. This. So, we, I'll, I'll give you an example. Can I give you an example? If you have won a soul this year and led it to Christ, put up your hand. And you led someone to Christ this year. You see what I'm saying? Twelve months are going to go by. And you're not going to win a soul for the kingdom. You're not even going to throw one party in heaven. But you come. You pray. You seek God. What do you want with God? You need something. But what does he need from you? What does he want from you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of these things we are seeking of God, the moment you're positioned in the right place, they will come. For sure they come. We are persuaded of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's go back to the point here. Now, I realize this, and all of you will agree with me, or some of you, that you can never force a man to love God. You can never force a man and say, love God, you understand? Eh? And beat them. Or throw them on the wall to love God. They can either love God or not love Him. They can endless serve or not. You can never push a man to serve. And I'm not here to tell you or to push you. No, 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 no. I'm here to give you a certain picture. Praise the Lord Jesus. I'm here to speak to somebody who says, I feel my potential is frustrated. I feel I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Because if you don't do what God has called you to do, the pangs will get you. And when they do, you start feeling out of place and think that there is another problem. And the problem really is not these issues that you're talking about. The problem is God has unfinished business with you. And it's another thing when God hasn't finished business with you. It's another thing. Because he will, he will deal with you until he finishes. You understand? So somebody's in a situation. You're nine months pregnant. You're expecting to give birth. You get to the tenth month, eleventh month, twelfth month, and you it's not dead, but it's not coming out. It's breathing, but it's not coming out. Are you hearing me? And then you say, ah, let me ignore it. 
And then you go for a job. And then you reach there. And a man says, sorry, we don't give jobs to pregnant women. You don't even know that you're pregnant. So he said, ah, I went for the interview and they bounced me and, and they didn't give me the job. No, they, they, don't, they don't give jobs to women because they know you're going to need three more months of maternity leave. And then you come and say, what devil is standing in my way? What devil is refusing me? Listen, the Bible says, who is our profession? Christ. Before you get a job, start to preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. But you know, winning souls and then jobs fail. And then you say, ah, ah. Musumba, I need now a deeper prayer. I need a deeper man of God who has a special anointing to lay a hand on me and say, get a job. And some get them. And they're only for a while and they lose them again. And then we go back to the drawing board. Can you get a job? Right now, that one also went away. Did you tithe? <laughs> Musuba, uh, once in a while. Okay, did you give your first fruit? Uh, uh, did you get, uh, no, uh, it's a weakness. Okay, let's pray for another one. Baby, let's pray. Mm, you understand? And then it, it, they repeat the same old story. And then they spend five years and six years. And then they go for counseling. And then they say, I have been born again for 20 years. <laughs> and I've never seen God. And you're like, You see, salvation is taking responsibility. Some people don't understand this. Salvation is taking responsibility of your life. Woman of God, nobody is responsible for your life. Not even the devil. Not even that auntie who hates you. It's you who is responsible. Fix it or struggle. It's that simple. Even if you don't say amen. You understand? So it means that you either know how to do it or you don't. Either way, the scriptures have given us a way how. The scriptures have given us a way how. Now, he says that there there are in this group people who say, you know what, I think I must set myself apart for the work of God. I must do it. I must do it for the work of God. Did I mean that I I don't work or that I don't have a job? No. I was a banker and Fenero was moving. And we were growing a hundred people every day. But we were still working 8 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. every day. So you don't have an excuse to say, ah, me, I'm working, apostle. No, 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 no. Listen. I want to make the bank rich for the glory of God. But I also want to make Christ rich. I must make Christ rich. So how do you balance work? And, 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 and the job, simple. You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. But then he says, in the making of these men and women of God, which are consecrated, he says, there are some which are eunuchs because they are born that way. I'll give you an example. He spoke of John the Baptist. And the Bible says, they spoke to the man, he says that he shall not drink wine, for he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother, mother's womb. You know, even when John the Baptist was in the mother's womb, he was full of the Holy Ghost. He was a child of the Holy Ghost. From the time he was in the womb, he had the Spirit of God upon him. Hallelujah. Now, when a man is made in that fashion, and they are born a certain way, you can't wake up And change it upon their lives. Do you understand? They don't need to fast a hundred days to see God. They can finish a feast and God appears. Do you understand? Moses was chosen by God from his mother's womb. Are you hearing me? And the scriptures tell us that the parents... Refused to give him over because they saw he was a goodly child. They felt something. And that is why it's important for every parent to feel your child. The reason why the church is wherever we are is some of us, many of us in the church, were not felt by our own. Do you understand? 
I wake up in the morning and I'm a shepherd boy. And my father tells me, go and look after sheep. And I go there and look after sheep every day. Until I'm even forgotten that I look after sheep. And one day a lion comes. And I tear it apart. And a bear comes. And I tear it apart. And I go back home and I don't tell my father anything. Why? Because it's not a story to him. He doesn't see me a certain way. And then I'm raised in a place where my fellowship is with sheep. I don't know how to deal with anybody or anyhow. Because that's how I am. That's David. All his life, he knows how to deal with sheep. All his life. That even the day he was going to be anointed king, the father forgot him. He brought every handsome thing and left David there. Until the anointing refuses to set on the man and Samuel says no. And that's the thing about the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Your thing can't set on another man. That day I had a loose conversation of Christians saying, ah, you see, that guy stole the anointing. You don't, the anointing is not a corruptible substance. It's an incorruptible entity. You can't steal a man's anointing. You can partake of it because you honor it, but you can't steal it. You can't steal the anointing. Some people come and say, let me tap. Do you know what it means to tap? Do you know what it means to tap? Have you ever seen a tap going upward? <laughs> you, you, you assume yourself same level or slightly above the man in your head and you say, I'm tapping. You can't tap. You can't tap. <laughs> That's not how they tap. That's why the Bible tells us submitting ourselves to one another in the fear of God. When I need to receive something from a man, I'll humble myself to him. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. So, David has to, to do all these things. And Jesse is not in his life. The day he goes to kill Goliath, Jesse should have felt it. And said, my boy, I don't know, I'm sending you for something, but I feel like something is going to happen in your life. But no, he had a mantle in his household and he did not know how to deal with it. And the boy goes, and the first man he tells that he has killed a bear and a lion is not his biological father. And the first day, Saul looks at David and loves him. The Bible says he loved David. <laughs> And from that day, he became his son. Now, your own biological doesn't see it. And then another man sees it. Another man sees it. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something I learned. It doesn't matter by whom you were born physically. When the gifting on your life coincides with a particular individual, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Unless you're too proud. It's only a matter of time. There can only be one king in Israel. Understand me. At that particular point. They can't be two. That's the challenge they had with Jesus. He also denied it and said, I'm not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. I can't frustrate that order. Do you understand what I'm saying? Cliffhanger. Jesus could not frustrate the order of also being a king physically. He said, no. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not of physical Jews. I'm not of spiritual Jews. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, they anoint Samuel. So Samuel anoints David, king over Israel. But there's a man on the seat. God doesn't touch him. Do you understand? God doesn't what? Touch him. But he anoints another fellow. And that transition of that fellow is, he must understand 
that the office has an anointing. The office, eunuch, the official, has an office. Are we together? And the anointing has its own glory. That I can carry an anointing, but not carry the office. You understand what I'm saying? Because the office comes with a certain responsibility. And look at what it starts like. So, whom the Spirit departed of. Eh? The Bible says when the Lord anointed David that day, the Spirit departed off for Saul. Immediately, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit started troubling him. But that evil spirit troubling the man was because God needed to create an experience where David is the solution. And you're dealing with a David who becomes a problem. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? You realize that the evil spirit that troubles Saul becomes David's ministry. But this is an anointed king. He wants to skip this process and get to the office. Do you understand? And get to the what? To the office. To the office. So you see a process where God tells the man, look, whether you want it or not, the pattern is this. Follow it or don't follow it. In this world, and I'll tell you the truth, if you want to have your own, be faithful in another man's. In another man's. Do you understand what I'm saying? My father used to work for a certain gentleman when he came to Kampala. And he used to be in a shop. And, and I remember the gentleman was arrested. And my father looked after that shop for six months and ran the family. And when the man came back and found that my father was faithful and had not taken a nickel, a few months later, my father got his own shop. That is how ministry is built. That is how business is built. That's how all aspects are built. Even when you're in a working system like administration. Be faithful in the bank's business. God will give you your own. He will not make you a better employee. He will give you your own office. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So he says, if ye be not faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? For you to have your own. Frustrate everything you want. The pattern is simple. Be faithful in another man's. That's hard, but it's the truth. You can say, no, in 20 years we shall know. Whether it's right, by God or it's wrong. But there's a necessity. So, you don't, you don't sit on camera because they are paying you. You sit on camera because you're faithful in another man's. You understand? When you're taking these speakers, don't just throw them away. No. Have a faithfulness to carry them and know as service to the Lord. As service to the Lord. The other day I, was, I, I had a problem, a, a very big problem in my head. There was this Christian who was saying, the Muslims are buying halal. All of us must buy halal. I mean, all of them are buying halal. Muslims, when they go to shops, they skip Christian shops and go to Muslim shops. But Christians don't do the same for fellow Christians. And I told the man, I agree to that extent. But I don't agree to the extent where the Muslim is more diligent than the Christian. And you tell me to get a substandard product because I must support a Christian. That's stupidity. Give me the quality, I will support you. If I find a Muslim more diligent, the Bible says, Seest thou a man diligent in his work? 
He didn't say born again man, a man diligent in his work. He says, for he shall stand before kings and not before mean men. If I don't promote him, another will promote him. Hey, that way, I can't stand in his blessing. Christians are acting funny on businesses. And they are speaking in tongues and they think that the grace is sufficient. If your taxi is dirty and the Muslims is clean, I will sit in a clean taxi because you must know we were not created to sit where pigs sit. So yes, I support Christianity. But quality Christianity. Things that bring glory to the gospel. Please rent our equipment. We are the best Christians. Rent our equipment. You get on the party. The machines start fighting each other. And say, ah, don't worry. You supported a fellow brother. No, I spoiled you. When your kid is two years, it's okay if they don't lay their bed. You can lay it. That's love. When they make five and you lay their bed, you're spoiling them. You're not moving in love. Christians, you better put your... Come on. If you're at your workplace, be the best employee the boss has ever had. Bring glory to God. That day somebody came and said, Apostle, I, 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 my boss, my boss is in my case. Hey, I told him your boss does not have the road for nothing. If they whoop you, you're not wise, fix it. But Apostle, I told him you fix it. Oh, she's rude. I said you fix it. Why? Because we don't live that way. We don't just say, somebody stood in my way. How? How? Come on, let's read the scripture. He's the God of all flesh. There's nothing too hard for him. If the Lord sees a just cause in your spirit and your boss is funny, God will twist his ankle and make you stay on the job. Hallelujah. But the Christian is not a hard worker. It's not a hard worker. The other day, some months ago, I saw a guy with a very nice attire and I said, wow, who makes that attire? And the guy told me, a certain born again lady in one day. I said, what? Those made here. No, no, no. She ships it from Ghana. I said, wow, that's nice. Can I buy it? I said, yeah. This is her number. And I was very busy during that time. You understand? And then I called the lady. I said, hi, how are you? I needed to buy a few attires from you. I'm told you import them. That's very wonderful. Uh, praise God. I'm happy to hear a fellow Christian in the business. But I said, but now, what provision do you have for people who are so busy? Because I'm so busy. How do I get time to go shopping? Miru Vega. How? <laughs> when do I get time to go picking what shoe? Well, it's very hard, except when I travel. But it's very hard to walk around Kampala with cars of... Because <laughs> I'm going to shop. It's very hard. No, it's not pride. I'm, I'm a very busy person. You need to look at my schedule and understand. Many of you, it's hard to even shop. People bring clothes to your shops. Because the time is not there. Uganda is a busy nation. So I told her. So I told her, what provision do you have for people who are busy? Because we also need to, yeah, to, to buy. She said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't move places. They either come, they either come, or it's not my blessing. I told her, oh, I'm sorry. Immediately I deleted the number. Why? There's a guy with three shops in Garden City called Baker. He's Muslim. If I call Baker now, he will drive and come now. I've been buying clothes from Baker for close to five years. And I've only gone to his shop twice. He asks me, sir, where are you? And I tell him I'm home. Let me drive. He gets in his Volkswagen. And then he drives to my, be- to my gate. And then you open. And he tells you, try this shirt on. Are you smart? Do you feel comfortable? You don't like it? Ah, there's another one I have. Then he says, can I come back under an hour? He drives back to town. He's not speaking in tongues. Then he brings the shirt. You understand? Then I know he's selling it expensively. But because I reward good work, 
I'll buy it. Because I reward good work, I buy it. That's why it's hard for me to buy Chinese things. Because I don't understand why you can just copy an original thing and sell it to an original creature. from Chinese copies are you with me the man who had the original mind was inspired by God to make the shirt and then a funny man is copying the idea inspired of God and I'm rewarding it the Bible says God hates and just waits that's why you'll be poor Stop buying Chinese clothes, which are funny copies. God doesn't like it. When you buy gold, he's like, oh, God. Oh, he's God, sorry. Oh, me. <laughs> Hallelujah. We must reward the man who takes time to sew that shoe with pure leather. Why? Because a cow had to die. Blood was shed. Then you say, no, me, I want synthetic fox leather. You fox it if you like. <laughs> Listen, it has its own people, but not for you. Believe God for better. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Becca would come and call me, where are you, sir? And then I tell him, but this trouser is a bit longer. Can I go cut it? Don't worry, it's my expense. He goes. One time I misplaced the shirt. I said, but Becca, you, you sold me a certain shirt. I don't see it. He said, ah, don't worry. Come for another one. He gave me another one for free. Such diligence. But you're dealing with a Christian. They find me here. Okay. We shall find you. They find you. Don't you realize you've pronounced a spirit of being lost? And then you ask yourself why your business is not succeeding. Oh, there must be a devil. There is no devil. Diligence. There is no devil. There is no devil. There's no devil. Let's begin with that wherever we are. Then you'll see what we, I told you. We, we are enough to create change in Uganda. Enough. More than enough to shake Africa. The model ministry, the church. If you get somebody from Fanero to work for you, they must work. I had somebody came and told me, oh, I called your people, they said for them, they are not under. I, I, told, I called these little girls, I told them you. How can you refuse to work because you feel you're deeper? <laughs> you refuse to work because you feel you're deeper. You're too deep to work. We were preaching the gospel and making lame men walk. And we used to sit in delight trucks at night. Taking goods the whole night. And this funny guy wasn't even one at all. They feel too deep to work. Diligence. Tell me about diligence. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But David needed a man to make him. To make him. But you can say, ah, no. no. No, it's okay. There can only be one king. <laughs> there can only be one king. And if character of maturity does not equal to the anointing of the king by the time you're there. David, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Something will find you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because some of us eh, have come from far that I can't go back. Me, you might not understand. You see me here. Me, 
I, and I'm speaking to some people here. Some of us where we are coming from, we can't go back. Hey, Mama Weje, can I take you back to 92? <laughs> Somebody say, I can't go back where I'm coming from. Say, it. I cannot go back from where I'm coming from. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So yes, there is a one which is born, like John the Baptist. Yeah? There is a one who looks like they're born, but they're not completed, like David. In fact, they are made... Moses was born a leader. They say from the child, time he was a child. John the Baptist was born with that anointing. You understand? Samuel was born with that anointing. You understand? He was committed. The mother said, if you give me a child, I shall give that already. Is the beginning that God had to manufacture a minister. There was no way that guy would come out without manufacture. You understand what I'm saying? But then there's a guy who is born and he's normal. He's looking after sheep. And God uses one guy. And he anoints him. And then he uses another. And he has to walk with this man every day. Until the day he understands the manner of a king. The time... The guy dies. The Bible says he brought his, after cutting a slit of the guy's garment, he judged himself and he brought his neck before the king. Then he says, oh, my dear king, I cut your what? His slit. For I deserve not to be what? He says he was smote with him and he had cut off Saul's feet. And then what happens? And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed and stretched my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Uh huh. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also arose up and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. He's bowing to a man who's what? Who wants to kill him? And he says, And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou? men's words saying, Behold, David seeketh thine heart. And he says, Behold this day, thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee to, to what? Today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me to kill thee. They were, they were telling who? And, and, and there's a wisdom there. <laughs> they're, they're all around you. Kill! Kill! You understand? Kill him, he deserves it. And he says, they bade him to what? To kill thee. But mine eye spared thee and said I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed the one from whom the spirit had departed he remained with the office and the next verse says moreover my father see ye see the scat of thine robin see he's now a father <laughs> he's now what a father and he says see the scat of thy robe in my hand. For in that cut of the scat of thy robe and killed... Sorry, for I, I cut off the scat of thy robe and killed thee. Not know thou see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. And the Lord judge between me and thee. And the Lord avenge me of thee. But mine hand shall not be upon thee. And the next verse says, As saith the proverb of the ancients, Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. And after whom it is the king of Israel come out, after whom dost thou pursue, after a dead dog, after a flea, and the Lord therefore be judge, and, there, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. And he says that it came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son and Saul lifted up his voice and wept that was the day David became Saul's son and that was the day he got the anointing of the office 
few days later, Saul was gone. They are eunuchs which are made of men. In this world, you might have not been born with a certain glory, but there are certain men and women in this world who can bless you and get you from one level and take you to another. Even when they wrong you, and everyone around you says, kill them, let your eye spare that place. Let your eye spare that place. Because if you don't, you could affect the rest of your life in ministry. The rest. You'll stay worshipping, you'll stay teaching, you'll stay preaching, but something will be of you. And you'll never know. Many men's ministries are where they are now. Because they cut cuts. Even if he's against you, don't be against him. Even if he has an issue with you, don't have an issue with him. He's your father. Don't. Unless you don't fear God. Don't. Leave him to God. You don't. Today we are having prodigal churches. Sons left. They just didn't agree with the pastor. Ah, then they go. They don't agree. Ah, then they go. They don't even talk. No. Either the guy says, I don't want to find him there. Let me tell you. If your spiritual father says, I don't want to find you there. If you know he makes something in your life, stay until he blesses you. Ah, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha, he casts the mount on the guy. Bam. And he says, can I go and kiss my mother by and father? And he told him, you go. If Elisha had gone, there were 6,990 men which could have been used. You can easily be replaced. Easily. Easily. That's why some men and women die before their time. Do you understand what I'm saying? The gospel is more serious than you think. It's more serious than you think. Go there and joke. You can joke. You can play in it. But it doesn't joke. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you. If in this world there is a man who can get you from one level or another. It means adding to your gospel. You understand? <laughs> Whether you want it or not, you are going to need them. I learned that early. Ali. Ali. I don't know how many radio stations I'm on now. But many years ago, I got a man who blessed my soul. And I started paying radio for that man's, ra- for that man's service every day. And up to today, he doesn't know who pays for those radio programs. Up to today, I didn't introduce myself to him. But I have a vow before God. To sign that check for that man of God to preach. Because if I honor him, I know what will happen to my media. I know what will happen to my media. Now, you just can't wake up and say a word and take me off radio. Because I'm not on radio by mistake. I was not born on radio. That man has to also live radio. You. you don't understand what I'm saying. The generation we're in, men of God, for us who were raised in a generation where there was nobody to teach us many things. Because some of the men we've seen down were so far from us. Some of us had to touch dead bones to live. We read books of dead men. E.W. Kenyon. Kennedy Hagen, does he still have a ministry? Yes. What can you do? Do you understand what I'm saying? I learned demonstration by a man who had died. I was reading a book, and that was the day I learned how to demonstrate the spirit. If I read in another page and he had erred, I would close it and still thank God 
he taught me how to demonstrate the power. No man taught me the go- to demonstrate. It was a book of a dead man. We touched dead bones. And maybe those books were on different men's bookshelves. But for me, when I held it, it gave me something. Forever I'm indebted. And then I went in the second move of the demonstration. It was a woman. A woman's ministry. I was also reading her book. And I saw something in there. And I meditated it the whole day. And I entered a church one day that evening. And I read two lines of the scripture. The whole church was on the ground. And the Lord has told me, you got that too. You got that too. Do you understand? There are things, even if you went to prayer mountain, you will never get. There are graces seated on certain people next to you. They can introduce you before one thing, and that thing changes your life forever. Forever. And God provides for it too. But then there are also men who will never have the opportunity to meet certain men and neither were born. But the necessity... The need of the gospel and divine purpose at that particular point, it looks for any man available. And he says, and some avail themselves for the sake of the kingdom. If this was physical castration, then it would have disqualified women. This eunuch is deeper than just a physical castration. It is a spiritual experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? In this world, I will tell you, if you are not born with it, you might need both. The man and your personal experiences with him, with God. But there are places where the man might not be enough, or your personal experiences might not be enough, and they will need the man. Be humble. Be humble. Be humble. There's some says, but me, I don't have anyone. Yes, there are people who don't have people in their lives to help them. God has created a place where he can only prompt them to avail themselves. The moment they are available, he will fill them. There are places in this world that certain, they're like empty offices. They've either not been sat in before, or the men which sat there are long gone. But God has appointed that there are certain men on the, in there which can see the internal job advertisement and say I don't see anyone there by the time I came in I didn't see somebody in that position but God I'm believing you I'm available and men who are available do certain things they do certain things they do certain things they do certain things praise the Lord Jesus when God left Elisha Elijah and told him there are 7,000 prophets. Let me finish with that. You go back. By the time Elijah went to the cave, he thought he was the only prophet. By the time he went, he thought he was the only prophet. When God tells him, I have 7,000 who have not bowed, it was the first time that his eyes were set on Elisha. If he had bypassed Elisha, Elisha would have needed to go to the mountain. Do you understand? And if he chose another one, that one would still be the man after him. God honors that order. God honors that order. Honor your pastors. Honor the men who feed you with the gospel every day. Honor them. Honor them. Fanera is a fellowship. It brings all kinds of people here. I don't know where you pray from. I've just done your, your pastors a favor. I've spoken things they can't say. Because they might think. But honor. If you feel some man can't take you anywhere, go to where you're supposed to. the one who can take you. Don't stay and scorn. Move to where God can what? But in this world, you realize it that God makes eunuchs of men by some men. And he makes eunuchs of men 
Because some just avail themselves and some are born. The one thing that seems to confuse the body of Christ are people which are born that way. Because John the Baptist started right away. He just started right away. There are things he knew that no man could teach him. He was born that way. He was born that way. Do you understand? It's a very confusing experience. It's a very confusing experience. And if John doesn't understand it, he might also err. Because he might assume that as he was born, therefore there is no necessity of being responsible in what God has bestowed upon him. I pray for you. I pray for you. That wherever God shall place you, either if there is a man which shall impart into you, or you shall avail yourself, but that it shall be in line with God's heart for you. That you never be too proud to refuse to receive from a man because you feel you can avail yourself. That's a wrong spirit. You have no part, no lot in the gospel. If there is a man which can help you or a woman which can help you, go on a them and serve them. God will use you. Some of you have gone to the mountains and you've come back and have not seen God. Do you realize that you can spend 20 years on the mountain and come back and realize you are just too proud to receive from another man? God help you. And this is my prayer to you, for you, in the name of Jesus. That whether he wills that it pass through a man, whether he wills that you avail yourself for it, in all these things I pray for you, that your heart will be humble and broken enough to receive whichever way he shall choose. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you're here and you have never given your life to Christ, and you say, me, I want Jesus today. Put up your hand now. I want to pray for you. Pray with you. Say, I want to be born again. Don't move. Let's finish this. Please. This is very important. Some people move out when the miracle is happening. God bless you, darling. I see a hand there. Anybody else who says, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus today. Somebody say, God bless you. Another one. I need Jesus. Another one. Come on. God bless you. I feel there are others. There are about another three. God bless you. I feel there's another one. Put up. Say, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus. God bless you. Somebody else. Say, I need Jesus today. Say, I need Jesus today. Put, let it stay up. Say, I need Jesus. Let it stay up. Brother up there. Let it stay up. Let the hand stay up. Oh, thank you, Lord. I see another hand in the back. God bless you. Somebody in the overflow. If there's somebody there too, tell them to keep their hand up. I feel there are another two. God bless you. I feel there's another one. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want you to repeat these words after me. If you put up your hand, say, Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. That you died and you rose again. From today, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have put up your hand and made that prayer, please come and talk to this fellow. We shall follow you up and share with you more about God. Somebody say, God, I thank you. I'm available to be used of you. Tell him I'm available to be used of you. Whichever way you want to, I must serve you. I cannot live this life a normal man or woman. I have to live this world with a mark that is distinctive that I served you. Deal with me whichever way you want. Break me. Bend me. Kill me. Whatever you must do. The frustration within my soul must see a manifestation of my daily groanings. Jesus' name. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us all. Now and forever. Amen. See you next Thursday.
take my life and let it be consecrated to thee. Take my life and send my just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. 
For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest.